Special thanks to our promotional partners at the American Philatelic Society. The APS is the largest stamp collecting organization in the world, supporting collectors of any level worldwide. For more information about membership and APS services, visit stamps.org. I'm Charles Epting from Exeter Harmer in New York City. I'm Michael Cortese of Noble Spirit in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. And this is Conversations with Philatelists. Now, we always talk about how we love for people to reach out to us mm-hmm. up here on the show. And, and today's guest true. is someone who listened and reached out to us. This is, <laughs> this is fantastic. This uh, you know, takes all the work off of our plate. Yeah, so Larry Rosenblum, uh, he's been a philatelic author for the past four decades, reached out to us and wanted to kind of share some of the articles he'd, he'd done and, uh, and written. And, and I, I, I know he's done a lot for Linz. Um, yeah. We're going to think it's great that he's a regular columnist for them still. Yeah. Um, I think this will be a lot of fun. That uh, Again, you, we, you know, we, we've touched on the editorial side of things, and obviously somebody like Wayne Youngblood writes a lot, but yeah. to have somebody with some insight into the writing process where he finds inspiration, uh, I think mm-hmm. this will be really cool because this is kind of how I got – I started in the hobby as well. Was, was writing a bunch, so yeah. I think it'll be uh, it'll, it'll be neat to hear his story. Yeah, this will pair well with last week's episode, Matt Hill. So we got the you know e- editor, and now we've got the columnist. With that, let's just get Larry on. Yeah, sounds great. Let's uh, bring him in now. Hi, hello, Michael. Hi, Mr. Rosenblum. Oh, please, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm privileged to join your <laughs> esteemed list of guests. <laughs> yeah, thank you. well, thank you for taking the time out. Um how have you been? How have you been holding up? Oh, pretty well, pretty well. You know, there's there's really been a silver lining to all this pandemic stuff and by being home I got to do um you know, a lot of things that I probably would that have been on my to-do list for a long time, but mm-hmm. I never had time to do so. And all this Zooming is really great. Uh, you know, <laughs> having, well, something like this, or I can attend meetings held on the East Coast or mm-hmm. in Europe or, yeah. you know, wherever. And um, so we make the best of it. We're fortunate to have all this good technology. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, without the technology, it would have... Uh would have hit us a lot different, I think. So, uh, Larry, uh, jumping right into it, can you talk a bit about your um, your history as a uh, philatelic reporter, if you will? Um, sure. Um, I, I guess I have to go back to um, to my early days. Um, I collected as a child, then traditionally you know dropped it kind of in junior high school college things like that and i came back to it um as an adult and i started collecting the stamps of great britain and um in 1979 i saw a little ad in lens for a new group that was forming called um the um uh, the Great Britain Correspondence Club. It was headed by a guy named Tom Current in Portland. So I joined that. Um, I, you know, I sent in an application, as it were, and he published a newsletter. It was typewritten in two-column format with some paste-up illustrations. And uh, in order to make his life a little easier, he decided he would just break words anywhere at the end of a line without a hyphen. <laughs> so I, I don't know what got me into it, but I dropped him a line and I said, you know, this is a little awkward. It's hard to read with, with words breaking in any place. And he wrote back to me and said, well, I don't want my newsletter to be hard to read, so I'm going to start putting in hyphens which he did so um having gotten off a little bit on the wrong foot but um we actually became friends and i got to know him uh, pretty well and um at the time i was collecting great britain and my specialty was the machin series and um tom more traditionally dealt with older 
issues and didn't know much about Masons. So we would sometimes correspond and, you know, um, de- talk to other people. And, and one time I wrote to him and I asked him a bunch of questions. And he wrote back and said, well, I don't know. Why don't you find some other contacts and talk to them and then write it up and we'll publish it. And I said, well, okay." So by that time, I had made some contacts in Great Britain. And um, so I did find things and I wrote some things up and, um, you know, started to do that. And I had also published a few small pieces in other philatelic journals and then he said well why don't you just do this regularly because he started to have a group of columnists on different subjects he had one doing victorian stamps and one during the king's era stamps and things like that so i became the machin columnist for the great britain correspondence club and um so that was really my first regular writing gig also um at some point there, Tom uh, introduced me to another Machen collector by the name of David Aldifer, who lived at that time near Pennsylvania. And we became good friends and um, started corresponding and, and that kind of stuff. So um, he even wrote a few articles here and there. So by the early 1990s, I had done quite a fair bit of writing mostly for clubs. And then in Linz, the editor at the time, Michael Lawrence, published a little request and said, our Great Britain columnist is going to retire and we're looking for a replacement. He would do that um, that sort of thing when they needed a columnist. So I uh, either I think I called up David and I said, I think we should do this as a team. And David said, okay. So um, I wrote to them and said, this is what we wanted to do. And they said, well, send us a sample column and you know we'll talk about it. So David and I did a sample column, which in retrospect, I didn't think was very good, but it was good enough to get us selected. And I do know that we had some competition. There were at least two other applicants for the position. So um, as a team, we started writing um, a monthly column called, uh, I think it was Introduction to Great Britain Philately or something like that. So that's really where I got my start writing for actual publications. So how many publications over the past, you say started in 1980, over the past four decades have you... uh... (laughs) have you been writing for (laughs) well um as far as commercial publications Mm -hmm. i did have in the 80s a couple of articles in stamp collector um but primarily everything has been either lens or scott stamp monthly Mm -hmm. both of which you know are the the same company ms press and um but i have continued from time to time i wrote for the Great Britain Collectors Club. Um, well, it was the Correspondents Club, then it became Collectors Club for almost 30 years mm-hmm. um, until about 2014. And unfortunately, a couple of years after that, the club folded. Hopefully, not because I stopped writing for them. <laughs> 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 but um, uh, so I wrote for them for a long time, and I wrote for a number of other club publications here and there when I had something to contribute. So probably about 10 different publications, maybe, all together. Hmm. When you look at philatelic literature over the years, obviously in the 20s and 30s, there was this huge proliferation of stamp magazines. But even up through the 70s and 80s, there were different trade publications and different general interest publications. You mentioned Stamp Collector in particular. What do you think it is about Linz that has uh, persisted? What do you think it is that makes that such a, uh, you know, that's sort of the the last one standing when you 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 used to have weekly philatelic gossip and stamps and all these magazines. Linz is the, uh, you know, really the the only game in town for a non-society publication in the U.S. What do you think makes that magazine so special? Well, that's an, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I guess they have just managed to have um, the broad enough reach to um, keep them viable. Um, they obviously uh, at some point bought the Scott catalogs and then they got into um, stamp collecting accessories that they do. So I would guess, and I have zero knowledge about this, but I would guess that they managed to put together a financial uh, business that was self-sustaining. And of course, Amos Press does a few other things. They do some coins and they do automobiles and stuff. Though I think that stamps is their major, um, the major part of their business. And I think you're right that it was smart to diversify with the products and the catalogs, obviously, because, you know, just running a mag, a stamp magazine mm -hmm. in particular for profit these days uh, without any other uh, avenues of, of income is, has got to be tough, as evidenced by, again, all the great magazines over the over the decades that have folded. Well, in Great Britain, I mean, they have three monthly magazines there that, you know, Gibbons being one and a couple of others that that seem to uh, be surviving. Uh, in France, I think one just recently folded, um, so not as successful. But here in the US, yeah, Lens is pretty much the only one left standing. So what do you think the difference is when you talk about, uh, you've, you've obviously written for different country magazines, so what do you think the difference mainly is between the U.S. Uh, publications and U.K. publications, France or any other country that you've <laughs> written for? Well, I, I certainly haven't written for a French publication. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I guess for the U.K., a couple of club publications. Um, I, I, I don't really know. Um, Do they have you s submit material that you suggest, or are they asking you for to research specific material and then you go out and find uh, the scoop um no i have to come up with all my own column topics and things mm -hmm. um and uh uh I, in fact at one time i asked them that and they said no it's it's just completely up to you now i've never had any um, concerns on their part that mm -hmm. I've done something, you know, inappropriate or not worthwhile. Um, but yeah, so it's all kind of up to me, which in a way is good. I find topics that are interesting to me that kind of motivates me to research them and put together an article that um, I think will be, um, uh, you know, interesting to the readers. So there wouldn't, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Michael. No, I was just I was just going to say. So there really isn't too too much difference in the way that the U.S. and the U.K. report material. Not, not that I can really think of. No, I mean every publication has its own style and its own mm -hmm. emphasis. Um, obviously, Lens emphasizes U.S. stamps. The British publications emphasize British stamps and British Commonwealth. Uh, more than others, but they all cover some degree of worldwide stamps. You talked about how you got started with the Machen series, which there's enough there to last many <laughs> lifetimes, I would say. <laughs> but wh yeah. wh wh where has your own personal collecting taken you since then? Have you been, um, you know, uh, pulled in any other directions, or and, and do you still have your your Machen collection uh, <laughs> at, at the at the center of your? Uh, you know, your philatelic interests? Well, I still have the Machen collection, but I haven't worked on it as much recently because I've kind of, as I say, crossed the channel into writing about France. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's still my primary collection and um, I still work on it somewhat. Um, my interests have tended to follow my writing. Well, my writing for Great Britain followed my interest to it, but with France, a little bit, it was the other way around. Um, I, I was uh, very flattered when uh, in about 2015, I, I happened to be corresponding with um, uh, Lynn's. Um, I think she was managing editor Donna Hasman at the time. 
um, over some other topic. And she said, you know, we really like your writing. We'd like to have you back. And I said, well, I'd be willing to do that. But, you know, I've kind of done Great Britain for a long time. And um, I'd like to do something different. So we settled on France, which I had had a little bit of interest in and a, and a small collection, actually, that I had purchased. But I didn't know much about French stamps. So they said, great, we haven't had a French columnist in a long time. Why don't you do that? And I said, OK, but I need six months to study up and get prepared. Mm -hmm. And they said, all right. So I spent six months trying to get as much literature as I could. Um, and, um, you know, otherwise kind of thinking and planning out stuff. And then in the beginning of 2016. So, so my collection of France has actually been guided by what I want to write about. So I will find a subject I want to write about. For example, for last year, for the 75th anniversary, I decided I would do some columns about World War II. So um, there, there's, turns out there's a, a lot of the story of World War II in France's stamps, um, most of which I had or I had a good enough sample to work with. But when I do a column, I like to illustrate with more than stamps. I like to illustrate covers, maximum cards, ephemera. I, I like to show things that collectors may not have seen before. So um, then I have to go out and buy these things. <laughs> uh, usually on eBay and Del Camp and you know, wherever else I can find them. So, so then I amass a thing and then I put together a little section of my collection that's World War II related things, some of which I use as illustrations, other of which I don't. And that forms part of my collection. And then I move on to another topic. It so, sounds like it's become sort of a situation of the uh, tail wagging the dog almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could say that. For me, it's, it's, it's really the dog is the, my writing. But from a collecting point of view, yes, that's true. So you mentioned finding material that collectors haven't seen before. I imagine with Great Britain being your, your specialty and, and a topic that's so popular in, in stamps, a lot of this material has already been covered before. How do you find topics and how do you find areas that, that haven't been so heavily covered already that you can go down and, and research to, to provide new information? Well, I'm not necessarily trying to provide new information. Mm -hmm. um, I don't consider my writing to be particularly scholarly. Um, once in a while, I may dig out some things that haven't been visible before, or I may put together information in a new way. Mm -hmm. But mostly I'm trying to um, at, uh, appeal to or attract, say, beginners to intermediate collectors. And um, my assumption is a lens reader, many of them, if not all certainly, you know, have, have not gone through the older literature or a lot of things. Mm. Um, and, and so certainly what I write has been often been covered before when it gets to say particular stamps i'm writing about in fact i draw on the old literature but i'm hoping that this is new to my readers to right. many of my my readers um in other cases where i'm telling a historical story like world war ii or something like that right um i'm, I'm hoping to add a little more um context to people's stamps and i hope that when they go to their album and look at these stamps, having learned a little bit from what I wrote, they go, oh, okay, now I understand a little bit more about the meaning behind that stamp. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing I'm, I'm trying to do, rather than making new discoveries or, or things like that. Right. Yeah, because I can imagine that, that new discoveries are, while happening all the time, are, are quite difficult to to come by. 
Yeah, that's, I mean, for a monthly or in the case of France, bi-monthly column. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not usually <laughs> happening there. <laughs> it's not usually I, happening there, right. I, I think there's also a higher um, return on your investment when you, you know, when you interpolate history and the stamps and when you can tell this more complete story, the people who are concerned about plating or a very specific postal history use, they're already bought in. They're already a collector and, mm-hmm. you know, they, they're, they're sort of, um, uh, again, they're a, a known quantity. Whereas if somebody who's maybe on the fence, maybe they collect something casually, they don't know much about France. I would imagine that these more general interest stories where you almost, um, I don't want to say trick them into learning about stamps, but you use the stamps <laughs> as a, a means to an end. I yeah. think there's probably a much higher reward there, a much higher potential for reward, at least with, um, well, you know, with, within that, that it's appealing to a larger to audience. Exactly. That beginning to mid-level collector will respond to that a lot more uh, enthusiastically, I'd imagine. Right. And I think that's a big part of Lynn's, um, you know, readership. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know any details, but, you know, it's a general purpose uh, magazine. Um, yeah. And and so um, I, I hope to do that. I hope to, yeah, to get collectors maybe who say, hey, this is an interesting country maybe i'll start collecting that or collecting part of it or something or um maybe i'll add to my collection some things that i show for example you know if i get someone who collects in perhaps what i can call the traditional way of you know just filling in an album Mm-hmm. And maybe they see some things and they go, hey, I'll add some postal history or I'll get some first aid covers even or, you know, something like that. Then I think I've accomplished something in helping uh, broaden their scope a little bit and expanding the hobby. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned David before. You actually wrote a book with him, I saw it as well. Correct? I did. Yes. So. um after we had written for a few years, Linz at that time was publishing some books, monographs, if you will, something like that, um, done by their columnists. And they asked us to, um, to do that. So we said, yes, um, we'd be glad to do that. Um, as it turned out, it was a lot more work <laughs> than, than we had um, expected um taking a bunch of columns and turning it into something that flows into Mm. a book and is organized i mean every column stands alone right we can write about machins one week and victorians the next week and postal stationery the next week you know um but in a book it kind of has to flow and there was some issues with you know what style kind of thing we were going to use so it wound up taking four years wow. of our time to do the book um also when we started we didn't have a large base of columns so after four years we had another 40 odd mm-hmm. <laughs> columns that we could incorporate um but the end result was good um the end result was by those four years Linz had gotten out of the business of publishing books but they kept to our agreement and published ours so ours is the last one that they published um but it was pretty successful um you know i went to some stamp shows afterwards and and i had met a lot of great britain collectors through the collectors club and other things and several of them had the book asked me to autograph it which (laughs) which i was pretty thrilled with um and said you know that it was very helpful um and things like that. So um, that's, yeah, that was definitely our uh, achievement. Yeah. A, a book like that is, um, is, is kind of a huge, well, not kind of, it is a huge responsibility. The, the introduction to the stamps of this, mm-hmm. uh, you know, undeniably the most important country to have issued stamps. They were, yeah. they, were the, they were the first. They're arguably the most popular outside of the U.S. What do you think it is about British stamps that makes them so appealing. Again, forgetting the penny black, everyone knows that's the first stamp. <laughs> what, what, what do you think it is? is? Is it the design? Is it the history? Is it the innovation? What you know? If you could sort of summarize um, the appeal of of GB stamps into um, you know like one thesis statement, what would it be? 
Well, I think it relates to the close ties, cultural ties between us and Great Britain. It's kind of a, a natural thing. The common language is a big help, right? Um, it It's a lot easier to deal with British stamps and British literature if you go that into it because it's in English. You can read it, absolutely. <laughs> Right. I mean, I know a little French, so that's helpful, but it's still a bit of a struggle for me to get when I when I have to deal with literature in French and uh, things like that. So I, I think it's the cultural thing as much as the specific stamps, um, although there are, as you point out, a lot of um, interesting aspects to um, to British stamps. So uh you're a member, not only a member, but you're an officer of two philatelic societies. Yes. Correct? And member to many yes. more. Can you can you talk a little bit about those societies that you belong to? So, um, as you say, currently I'm an officer of, uh, in, in two clubs. Um, one is the France and Colonies Philatelic Society, which obviously relates to my writing of France. Um, there's actually two of these societies, one in the U.S. and one in the U.K., with mm. exactly the same name, but they're different, <laughs> totally different. Um, so as soon as I started in uh, dealing with France, um, I joined the U.S. Society and ordered some back issues of the journal and things like that and um, got to know a few of the, the other members. And then they had a vacancy on their board of directors. And hmm. since I had experience in a number of clubs, I thought, well, I can I can participate with that. So, um, you know, I wrote to the president and said I'd be willing. And so I've been a director for about three years. And I think I can say that I've contributed um, my share to the organization and and done some things um you know to help running the club uh the other group that i'm uh involved with is is totally different it's a small thematically oriented uh, group called the graphics philately association and i actually got into this through some friends of mine many years ago um who invited me in. Um, what we mean by graphics philately is philately that has anything to do with nonverbal communication. In other words, communication that's in some form of graphics, whether it's pictures or letters or other alphabets or, or things like that. So the scope of the group is, print, is very broad. It deals with books and printings and alphabets and um, you know, paper and ink and um, writing styles, calligraphy, all sorts of stuff. Uh, so the scope is very broad, but the group is pretty small, although it's been growing in recent years. Um, we've, we've put some effort into that. It's about 60 members now. Oh, wow. And um, uh, it's a very enthusiastic group. And so I enjoy it. And, and over the years, <laughs> you know, if you're willing to do the work, so I'm now the president, the treasurer, and the secretary. Of the group. <laughs> <laughs> and where are both of those, are those both located in California? Where are those? Well, I mean, location of a club, there's yeah. really no location. It's wherever the officers happen to be. So. Yeah. There's no real home base. There's no physical manifestation of those. Okay. Um, but I, I would like to say for our listeners who might be interested in you know, give the web addresses, if yeah. I may. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And we'll put the links in the description of the episode as well so that yeah. people okay. can find them. Okay, great. So, so the French Society is franceandcolonies.org. And um, the Graphics Philatelic Society is graphics-stamps.org. Mm -hmm. I think the Graphics Philatelic Society in particular is interesting because it shows you, and it's one of the things Michael and I have tried to demonstrate with this podcast, 
is how many different directions you can go with stamps. A lot of people think it's just you have to get one of each and you stick them in an album <laughs> in chronological order and, and that's it. What's the, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And I think something like the Graphic Philatelic Society shows that there's so many different avenues you can take this. Um, that, that you know, might, probably wouldn't even cross most collectors' minds. I think that really shows just how diverse and multifaceted philately can be, you know, sort of outside of this, this common misconception that it's just stick them in order. Yeah, uh, our main purpose, our, our main problem is getting ourselves known because there's a lot of people I speak to and they go, oh, yeah, that's fascinating, you know, mm -hmm. I want to I sign up. Um, it, 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 often because they're just interested or they've been involved in printing or in publicity, you know, some some form of nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. And they find this an interesting topic. So that's one of the things I've tried to work on is getting our name out there a little bit, but it's, but it's difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when did you start um, collecting thematically that, that uh, topic? Well, I kind of got it into it, as I said, sideways. Um, I had had a collection of the stamps of the engraver Teswav Swania, the famous engraver. And there were there was a club dedicated to his works, which I was a member of. And um, there were a lot of members in common between that club and the Graphics Philately Association. So that's really how I got into it. I didn't really collect graphics themed mm -hmm. material at the time and it's still to me only a small part of my right. collection but um i find it interesting and as i said the group is very enthusiastic and so i'm glad to uh to help um you know run the organization mm -hmm. i feel like that's been a common uh theme uh, if you will among among uh, a lot of our guests is is they a lot of their collecting interests, they kind of came into sideways. They, it wasn't their original intention to collect this uh, this topic or this area. And, and then they just kind of discovered it almost by accident, and it became one of their largest passions. So I think the, the vast scope of the hobby allowing people to... Uh, still find things they're interested in at such advanced stages in their collecting interests is is incredible i mean you, you you think you know everything and then you turn a page on a book and you realize you had no idea that this other topic had had such a you know vast range so now you, you you're doing your your french column and you you you've conquered great britain where do you want to go from here? What, I, 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 once you write a book like that and you write so many columns, I feel like you've probably, uh, you know, uh, said said most of what there is. Is there another country that you have your sights set on? Is there a specific area within French philately you'd like to go? Um, is there anything you want to revisit in Great Britain? What are your goals uh, moving forward in terms of your writing? <laughs> well, I confess I haven't thought a lot about it, but. Um... There's there's a lot more in France mm -hmm. for me to deal with. Um, if I can sidetrack a little bit, um, well, that, that, that's the, all Michael and I do is sidetrack. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So one of the thoughts that came to me after I did France a number of year for a number of years is, hey, French stamps are a lot more interesting than British stamps. Which, you know, I'd done British stamps for like 30 years and then to have this kind of revelation. But I thought about it more, and it's it's more nuanced than that. And what I came to, a, a couple of conclusions. First of all, there's kind of a chronological boundary. The British 19th century stamps are much more interesting than the French ones, right? They have the line engraved, they have the surface printed, all of the things they did to try to avoid forgery, mm -hmm. you know, their experimentation and changes and all that stuff. Whereas the French were just churning out typographed stamps. <laughs> they were a little busy fighting wars from time to time and things like that, which Britain was lucky enough to avoid in any major way during that time. 
But flip over to the 20th century, and I think it reverses um, Britain's conservatism with relationships to stamps is pretty well known. And whereas France, you know, kind of developed on a more typical fashion, um, France had a long history of semi-postal stamps, although they don't do that very much anymore. They have some airmail stamps. They have pictorial pre-cancels. They have parcel post stamps. Great Britain has few or none of those kind the of things. The fact that GB's first commemorative didn't come out until 1924, I think, mm. is shocking <laughs> compared to what so much of Europe was doing by that point. Yes, exactly. So... Um, so, you know, so there's a still a lot more meat with regards to France that uh, that I haven't covered yet. Um, but I, but I do want to continue on and say with regards to Britain, there are a couple of things. First of all, the Machen series, as we talked about, is kind of unparalleled. Um, a lot of collectors are interested in that, um, you know, to some degree of, of depth. Um, the other thing is Britain has a number of really classic stamps. The one pound uh, 1929 stamp picturing St. George killing the dragon is just mm. an outstanding stamp. Um, the seahorse definitives starting in 1913 with Britannia riding into the waves challenging the Germans for the domination of the seas. Um, things like that. And if you look at France and go, what are France's outstanding stamps, you know? Mm. <laughs> hey, I can't pick one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Britain has had a number of highs, if you will, but, but overall it's been France. So to get back to your question, um, as I said, number one, I think there's a lot more of France. Number two, the whole area of what's lumped together and called French colonies is a big one. And um, I'm just sort of getting my feet wet in that. It's, it's amazingly complex, especially you go back to the late 19th and early 20th century, and they had colonies and offices abroad and things changed every couple of years and things like and that. And the fact that they issued the same stamps for all of the colonies initially <laughs> is, is interesting. That's, you know, you had these these general issues that were just for use in the colonies. I think that's a, a curious distinction as well that, that sets that apart from obviously the, the Commonwealth and other um, colonial issues. Right. So um, I've been trying to find a way to get my hands around that and write something about it. Um, but I haven't been successful. So I guess looking forward, I would branch into that a little bit. Um, I don't know whether that would be another series of columns. Maybe if I get really adventurous, um, it might be, or I might just lump it in um, with my regular columns. I, I haven't decided yet, but, but that's, that's a kind of a forward-looking area that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, we always uh, encourage people to join organizations, but can you talk a little bit about how the organizations that you joined helped your learning French stamps? Um, absolutely. Um, well, the publication, the journals, obviously are a reference. And um, since I joined, they have now put all their back issues um, on their website yeah. in PDF format. Um, the last five years, the most recent five years are only available to members, but the older ones are all there. But more importantly are the contacts and the friends that I've made and the people who are willing to help out. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with regards to Great Britain when I was writing about that. Um, that's the most important thing because I have people that I can go to and ask questions about. I try not to overdo that, but, um, uh, you know, if there are things that I don't know about or don't know where to look, I do have some people that I can ask and who are very willing to help me out. Um, ironically, I had two people that I met during my Great Britain days who helped me write columns 
about France because they had interests that extended into that as well. Um, so the, the social part of it, the clubs and the stamp shows and all that has always been an important part of philately to me. And, um, and obviously joining a club with uh, members who are interested in the same things is a big help. Mm-hmm. And then my last question, Michael, I'm not sure if you have any others, but, but for me, this is kind of a, um, maybe a strange one. I was somebody who, I, I think I'm guilty of a, a philatelic faux pas that a lot of people are guilty of in that I initially didn't have very much respect for the mansion because they're <laughs> everywhere. They're ubiquitous. We get people who can sign bags of them to us. But I was in um, Stockholm uh, two years before the big show. There was a, a summit where people were giving talks. And uh, Larry Haber gave a talk on yes. the half penny major. And of everything that happened that weekend at the Philatelic Summit, Larry Haber's talk on the half P major is the, the highlight for me. It's the standout for me. And that single talk changed the way I look at those stamps. Now, I have much more respect and appreciation for them rather than just tossing them aside because they're everywhere. They're like, you know, ants around the office. <laughs> what is your um, elevator pitch to somebody about the Matron series? Why is this series so important? What makes it interesting to collect? What are the, again, why, why would you steer somebody towards the Matrons versus something else? Well, um, the Matrons have obviously been important because they've been essentially the only definitive stamps that Britain has used for the last 54 years. Um, so, you know, there are billions and billions of them, uh, literally. Um, so from that point of view, from the point of view of what have people used the stamps for, for actual mail use, they're very important. I mean, there are obviously oodles and oodles of commemoratives that are fascinating to collect for a number of reasons. But at least these days, you know, for the last 20 odd years, they're not used on mail very much. Right. So I think they're important from that respect. Another respect is they can teach you about almost every aspect of stamp printing. Right, because they've gone through almost everything with the exception of watermarks, because there are no matrons with watermarks, and um, there are no intentional imperforates, things like that. But almost everything else, papers and inks and phosphors and luminescence and perforations and all that stuff. So Even the, gu the gums have changed, too, I think. Is interesting. Yes, you know, right, even gums. in that regard. And, and I think they're interesting, too, because on the one hand, they are ubiquitous. But like everything, there are some great rarities out there, probably sitting in albums uh, unspotted, I would imagine. Yes, right. There are a lot of subtle distinctions um, that, that might go unnoticed. Um, I, I've never gotten too much into shades, but there are a few people who do that, but some slight changes in the phosphor or, you know, shifts in the phosphor, missing phosphors, changes in the perforation, you know, there are some things, changes, subtle changes in the queen's head. There's one very scarce machin, which is scarce only because it's got a little different queen's head. There are actually, um, you know, several different variations of the queen's head that were used based on the background of the stamp and the size of the portrait. And um, so there are a couple of rarities like that. So, um, and I think collectors, frankly, are fascinated by the colors too. You know, it's, it's a way of kind of getting into the series. And you look at all the colors and you think about, well, you know, why did they change this color from this to that for this denomination or something like that and then you get into well hey not only is the color different but the paper is different or the bands are different or you, you, you as i did you kind of get trapped and you fall deeper and deeper <laughs> into it but but it, it, it's it's pretty easy to put together a, a, a set of uh, i don't know how many uh, major varieties there are not counting paper and phosphor and things like that but there's got to be hundreds 
and it's fairly easy to put together. <laughs> you can put together an impressive looking set of stamps, uh, you know, affordably and, and easily, which has to be part of the appeal as well. You're right. When, yeah. you, when you see those rainbows of matrons, you know, the, mm. the dozens of different colors. Right. Yeah. There's about 500 now, I think, if you just look at <laughs> color and denomination and, you know, a few other very obvious characteristics. Um, and then, of course, if you get into variations, it goes way up into the thousands. So it's a, it's a very fascinating and a very popular topic. So to the extent that I might have helped some people, you know, mm. gain an understanding. A lot of the columns we did with Lynn's were about Machen's, which was partly because that was our interest and partly because it's such a rich subject, you know, so people probably wanted to hear about it. Yeah. 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 I, I remember I was just looking through some old stuff when we started printing, uh, writing for Lynn's, they were only in black and white. And a few years later, they started having a few pages in color. And I wanted to write about Machen colors. But we would have to negotiate with them a little <laughs> bit. Say, okay, can we get some colored pages in such and such an issue so I can write about colors? <laughs> and they would say yes or no or whatever, you know. So, so Funny how quickly so times change. Did. Yeah, You're right. Yeah. Well, Larry, thank you so much for, for joining us today, taking time out to, to talk to us about four decades of, of writing philatelic articles. Uh, thank you for that. For uh, people who don't know, what was the name of the your book again? We'll put a link in the description, but the name well, of the book? Uh, the book was Introduction to Great Britain Philately, but mm -hmm. it's no longer on sale. Oh, it's no. Okay. But so in part because... Um, you know, Lynn's got out of the business, so mm -hmm. they did one printing of, um, I think it was 500 copies, I'm not sure, and that was it. So I'll find someone I, selling one book, and I'll put a link to that. Well, <laughs> yeah, you can find it occasionally on the used book market, mm -hmm. so yes. I'll find it. Well, thank you so much for, for talking to us. This has been uh, really interesting. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, good. I thank you very much for the opportunity and a pleasure to meet both of you. Yeah, you as Same well. You. Uh, see hopefully, you at a show, uh, hopefully. I was going to say, hopefully uh, we'll be able to, to thank you in person someday, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks again. All right. Thank Take you care. soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Like, I thought that was really interesting to hear his story his background in writing um, and again, the fact that he stuck with it for so long mm -hmm. and has such a prolific body of work has a lot of experience with magazines on both sides of the Atlantic. I think it was mm -hmm. interesting how he, uh, it, it wasn't as much differences as you or I maybe expected. Yeah, most, most certainly. And, and the, the freedom that they get to write the articles, you, you know, it's not like traditional newspapers. The, the editor says, hey, go get this scoop. You know, hey, go figure out what's happening over here. Go oh, right outside the courthouse or whatever, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's They're really given the freedom to if investigate, if you will, in the topics that they like best and they want to share and they think people will be interested in. They research them and they prepare them. The, the fact that he spent six months researching French stamps before he even felt comfortable submitting an article about French stamps uh, talks to the professionalism of the people writing these articles for philatelic newspapers. Sounds like something you almost want to do someday. Maybe you'll have an opportunity <laughs> to, to write with a blank slate someday. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's a, it's called a callback. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was a, a, a fun conversation. Mm -hmm. so, like one other thing we wanted to do uh, last episode, and we we ran out of time to be honest. Mm -hmm. is, um, uh, we love reader mail. We love when people send us their stories. Yeah, and, uh, we we read one of them a couple of weeks ago, and I think you've got another one for us to read today. Yeah, so we got one in. Uh, this was actually well, we, just we've more than one, but there's one in particular. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, this one in particular. I wanted to highlight, I reached out to the gentleman and he said he was fine uh, with us sharing the what he wrote in. He wrote in pretty soon after the new year. 
So it it um goes a little it. So he wrote in. <laughs> it goes a little like something this. like this. Okay. Charles and Michael, love your shows. Just wanted to say that I saw your Curse Green episode and then your December 21st holiday short version and enjoyed them very much. You two guys are really entertaining and help make stamping so much fun. May I suggest that you both talk somewhat more about your own philatelic interests, including some show and tell events where you show your own personal collections. Many of the good folks of the North Toronto Stamp Club in Toronto, Canada, Enjoy your shows immensely, and if you have any interest in engaging with one or more of my fellow flatalists in some future show, that would be super. Then he goes on to write, this is why I highlighted this one, he goes on to write, by the way, have you seen our current virtual 2020 stamp exhibition entries on the internet? Uh, Well worth looking at, and then he gives us a link. So I took a look at some of the exhibits. He writes that personally he did the uh, masterpieces entry and the Rome flight of the Graf Zeppelin entry. And they're, they're quite exciting exhibits. And I think the the way that they presented them and the, the whole club themselves uh, compiled these these exhibits is, is interesting. I'm going to put a can link. A link to these? Well, yeah. Because I, I think um, uh, people would love to take a look at those. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons I highlighted this one, this email in particular, was because I wanted to provide the link to their exhibits in the uh, in the description here, so people can take a look. Because I really do think that a lot of these exhibits, they've they've done fantastic work on them. So um, this was uh, Daniel from Toronto, Canada. That's a fantastic note. We should do something with the stamp club. Yeah, we should. And yeah, I would love to talk. Maybe do uh, you know. A couple of short little uh, sound bites with some of their members. Do a, an episode on the club. Yeah. So I actually I wrote back to him a while ago. We've since been corresponding, and he actually suggested that we get a like a small panel of the members from the club on one episode, so we can just talk to maybe one of them at a time, and That's it'd be good. the first for us having more than two people on. The the uh, the other thing is I you had showed me this note a while back, and I forgot that this was the one that asked about our own personal collecting interests. Yeah. Which leaves me very off guard. <laughs> my my collections are scattered uh, across the office and across uh, most of Manhattan by now, I would imagine. Um, so maybe at some point we should do an episode, a, a mini episode, or mm-hmm. maybe we have enough to do a full episode um, mm-hmm. of, of show and tell. I've got yeah. some cool things that I've even bought in the last couple of months. From H.R. Harmer? No. Well, one. Yes, a uh, 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 machine cancel. Actually, I, bu- I bought it because of the machine cancel, mm-hmm. but it's actually rare because of the postage due stamp on it. Hmm. But I have no interest in the postage due stamp. I just wanted the machine. And you just cut the postage due one off, yeah, soak I was, it off. I'm make a cut square of the machine cancel. But yeah, um, I I think that would be a fun, and I'm sure you've uh, accumulated some things. Yeah, it's it's tough to pick what uh, would be what I would deem. Because you care about everything almost equally. My my favorite things are things I've spent like $2 on. (laughs) And some of the things that I've spent hundreds of dollars on, I'm like... Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's it's weird how the hobby works in that way. That Sometimes the things that are $2 can almost, and with a grain of salt, almost be just as rare as the things worth hundreds or thousands of dollars but they don't necessarily have the amount of people it shows you that not rarity that determines the market there's plenty of things exactly. i have that are unique yeah that i could not get a dollar for <laughs> <laughs> so I, I i would love to do an episode where i just show off a couple of things you show off a couple of things yeah not, not um you know not big ticket of course you know icons of philately but just the things that got me started and the things that I still turn to whenever work gets stressful. Yeah. I need to look to these things to remind myself why we why we do what we do. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion and, and I think sometime in the future it, it would be really fun to get the people of the North Toronto Stamp Club, you know, a group of them together and, and get them on the show and talk to them about uh about their club. We can make it like Freddy Bunny with all the little Exactly. Yeah. So, so by the time this airs, the Chatty Award voting uh, will have closed. We yeah. will hopefully have uh, an update on that soon. Yeah. The the close and then, so this is going to air February 1st. The 4th is when they're announced. So this is between closing and the announcement. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So by the time people are listening to this, we won't know. 
if we have a caddy yet. Yeah. We hope you guys aren't too nervous. We're on the edge of our seat. <laughs> I asked uh, my office manager, Angela. I was like, hey, you got to bring the caddy awards yet? She said, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> so if that doesn't speak to our chances of success, I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, my wife voted for us. Kaylee. Yeah. Did Olivia vote? I believe Olivia. Uh, no, actually. Is it? He, it's not that it, she didn't want to vote. It's that yeah. I forgot to send her the link. Mm, okay. <laughs> Speaks to our chances of success. Uh, um, but trust me, I voted myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Of course. So, no, we'll, we'll see. But in the meantime, we are on uh, all the major podcast platforms. True. We have uh, an email that is flatlypodcast at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Similar to our website, which is flatly flatlypodcast.com. Yeah. It comes around and it starts to not sound like a word. Um, and yeah, send us your emails if you have somebody you think we should talk to. If you're somebody you think we should talk to. True. Yeah, we, we get a lot of suggestions for people we should talk to. And a lot of the suggestions that we get, we actually do reach out to these people and yes. attempt to talk to them. As opposed to just ignoring the emails. We don't, yeah, I don't, I try my best not to ignore. We actually um, read the yeah. <laughs> As if we're, like, too busy to respond to email. <laughs> Write to us, please. Yeah. Love, um, I always get excited when, when we get something new. Okay. Yeah. That's a big deal. To us. The best ones are when... The best the best ones that we get are when we're recording the show, and then in between takes, I check my phone, and I see that we've received an email about the show that we're recording. I, I like those ones. Really? I don't what get do you mean? I don't get the emails on my phone. I don't get the yeah. emails on the computer either, to be honest. <laughs> Giving you the password multiple times. <laughs> you screenshot them and send them to me, which yeah. allows me to live vicariously through you. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Well, this was fun. It was a great chat with Larry. Love hearing from uh, from our, our listener up north. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's do it again real soon. Yeah, I'll talk to you uh, next time. Sounds good. Talk to you next week, Michael. All right, see ya.